Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are live right now on Cannabuzz at youtube.com slash Cannabuzz. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've got a great show. We are joined with a special guest, Chef Sebastian Croce. We're going to be talking all about um, what he's up to in the um, mixing, all the stuff that you can do out there with foraging plants out in the wild and bring that into the kitchen and all kinds of really cool stuff that you can do with that. Um, but before we get too far into it, I want to thank all of our supporters, everyone that follows us and subscribes on YouTube. Um, in the description below on this video and all of our other videos, you can find our Discord server, which you can join our community over there, as well as our email mailing list so that you can keep in touch with us and hear about what we're up to next. We've got a lot of things coming up on the horizons. And then lastly, I want I need to give a special shout out to Tiki Madman uh, for sponsoring this show. Uh, he's helped us out a lot with doing a bunch of things recently. That was uh, Emerald Cup out in Santa Rosa. So if you need genetics, you need some great cannabis seeds to start your year off right with some dank, go to uh, TikiMadman.com and uh, get some genetics. So, um, also, since this is a live show, we will be keeping an eye on live chat. So if you're watching this live at some point and you want to throw in a comment or question or whatever, feel free to jump in and I'll uh, grab some comments from there. But, um, so tonight we're going to, we have a little bit of an intro for, uh, chef Sebastian. Um, this is a section that JR grabbed, which was, uh, the chef in his own words. He says, I'm no mycologist, mushroom expert, or by any means a mushroom specialist, more like a wild foods antagonist and an enthusiastic wild mushroom stalker. But I've been foraging, filling baskets, and cooking mushrooms, specifically wild ones, for well over 30 years now, and somehow it has been considered a professional career. So, uh, Sebastian, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's great to have you. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me, JR. Thank you. Both of you. Thank you. And uh, happy holidays and Hanukkah and Christmas and all that to everybody out there. I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah. Really stoked to have you. We have a lot to talk about. I'm pretty excited about tonight's topics. So, Definitely. JR, do you want to get us started with the with the first question? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I mean, I'd like to kind of break this up into three parts. Uh the first part, I'd like to talk about your cannabis journey and how you got started uh, with cannabis and cannabis cooking and how it got you to where you are right now. So uh, growing up in an East Coast hippie household uh, back in the 70s and 80s, my father was a cannabis consumer, grower, and also a cancer patient and also happened to be in the medical industry and field. So um, cannabis use was around my house from when I was young all the way up. And it wasn't for reasons of getting high all the time. It was for medical reasons. And, you know, being back in the seventies is back when the big push for what was medically, you know, what was cannabis going to be medically used for, whether it was going to be smoking the plant, you know, cooking it down into RSO or eating it raw or juicing it, or, you know, where did we stand? And plus that just led us all to the outlaw days of kind of just staying in our own houses and not doing things. So I took that cannabis use throughout my entire career as a chef. And as a young chef, you know, I would get fired from jobs because I would come back in reeking of ganja and weed. And they were like, wow, you know, you're fired. So <clears throat> it led me on some ups and it led me on some downs. And when I was young, I actually, when I was really young, growing up here in the Pacific Northwest, I got caught with a little bit of cannabis and uh, had to do a vacation, go, went bye-bye for a while. And uh, from there, I learned that it was kind of transitioning here in Washington State, specifically in the I-502, into a legal situation and medically and then a recreationally, uh, you know, available situation. And so with a culinary career in that was based on farm to fork movement and using local goods, uh, growing and utilizing hemp and cannabis in my diet kind of became regular, uh, you know, uh, not, not always 
decarbo decarboxylating cured buds, but eating small shoots, you know, juicing big fan leaves, not eating the fan leaves like you see a lot of people trying to do today, these huge leaves, but, you know, considering it as a uh, just a, an agricultural plant like a chef would, and, you know, a chef's not going to give you some big raggedy ass lettuce leaf. They're going to give you the nice shoots, the fine shoots of things. And that's where we've actually seen and heard and have been tested and scientifically found that the majority of the nutrients that we need for cancer combatants and things that are hidden in the cannabis plant are actually at. Uh, so that drove me. It's like, wow, a new ingredient, you know, and I took that with me. I use it in savory dishes. I use it in sweet dishes. I use it in raw dishes, anything you can think of. Because for me, it was like I wanted to create a pantry where I could grab things out of my kitchen and use a microdose of cannabis in everything, whether vanilla, oil, can coconut oil, so on and so forth. That's really cool. So then as you kind of uh, kind of became a cannabis chef, uh, what are some of the really cool uh, cannabis chef gigs that you've got to do over the time? Man, I've done everything from cooking for Belushi, which is kind of cool for me. And, you know, one of the, I said I lost jobs before. Uh, some of the iconic sports figures were really cool to sit and smoke with. But I used to work for the Bush family, you know, like President Bush in Maine. And <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> sitting behind the house and the boathouse on Walker Point in Maine smoking weed when I went in and have to cook them 35 lobsters for dinner was one of the coolest damn things in the world, man. I'm non-political, but I'm sitting there with the former president and his son is the president now Right. at, at that time. And I'm in the back lighting, lighting up the fuck, you know, smoking the bowl. It was great. <laughs> That's awesome. So you kind of touched on some of the ways that um, uh, cannabis can be used. Can you kind of touch on some uh, basic, uh, just a basic savory Re a recipe or application that someone could do with their harvest that they have at home that they maybe harvested from their tent? Absolutely, Jar. I would say, you know, start with something simple like making butter or nor coconut oil, not MCT, but coconut oil, solid at room temperature and or butter from a cow. And then kind of just letting those transpire over into your savory items because then you're limitless. Then it's just about your creativity. And for me, for savory items, I actually like the, um, uh, I like to infuse different oils, even like sesame oil and things that, that are richer. So for savory for me might be a simple salad, you know, with a little smoked trout, maybe some berries and sesame or walnut oil infused with cannabis, some young cannabis leaves and some walnuts. I'm a, I'm, I'm like a fucking rabbit, man. I eat salad a lot. Uh, but <clears throat> it doesn't bother me because you can put as much protein in as you want it, and it kind of hides all the leafy greens. And yeah, definitely savory is oh, oh, I like savory. And how are you doing um, a lot of are you doing some of these infusions yourself? Do you have any like, I guess, quick tips? You, you mentioned um, I thought it was interesting that you sp said specifically not MCT oil. And you mentioned um, butter or something like that. So do you have any tips for people to easily infuse stuff with butter? So I am not uh, gonna, trying to sell a product yeah, or anything that's cool. to anybody. But um, there are a lot of countertop botanical extractors. Specifically, there's magical butter. And um, I'm not going to tell you my promo code so you get a 10% discount. I'll give it to these guys so they can get to you. <laughs> but, uh, do it. Shout it out. Um, uh, you know, so I'm actually sponsored by Magical Butter, and I have been oh, cool. from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> and we didn't plan this or anything. Uh, yeah, no. Actually, so I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, yeah, you know, back in the day, I used to do it on the very crude, rude crock pot style. Six crock pots growing at every time. You know, yeah. one with olive oil, one with coconut oil, one with. And uh, the reason why I say, um, and 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 I will get right to the point. Uh, you specifically said something that i said the mct oil yeah coconut oil in solid form and mct coconut mct oil neither one of those are actually good for you if you do some solid research uh so cannabinoids like fat italians have been using olive oil for i don't know six thousand years now if you're going to use something use olive oil 
uh, use a natural oil from where you live. You know, we even actually have olives growing here in Oregon and Washington state up here in the Pacific Northwest. Right. So really do some research about, because actually you're administering yourself a healthy dose of cannabinoids. Why wouldn't you make its delivery system as healthy as you can possibly be? And there's a lot of bullshit out there, but just, just do some research, you know, um, really do some research. Lard isn't bad now. Bacon fat isn't bad for you now. You know, they've, they've really started doing the research. So any fat is a good vehicle to have to deliver cannabinoids, except for sugar. We can't let this continue to happen in the gastronomic and cannabis world where you go into a dispensary, a pot shop, whatever you call it in the state that you're in listening, uh, and the delivery system is gummies, lollipops. Chocolate. Listen, we got where we got yeah. in cannabis under the auspices of medicine and medicinal behaviors of cannabis on the body. Sugar is not the answer. And you see more sugar and packaged gummies and bullshit in a dispensary here in the Pacific Northwest than you do flour nowadays at some. Yeah, you know, I, think they yeah. Said, I think they said in uh, Oklahoma, it's like almost 80% of their market is edibles. Yep. And so and now then, um, as people start to use the butter machine and they get their, uh, their oil or their fat, um, what are some basic uh, uh, baking recipes that they can do to kind of uh, be successful, but not totally like wipe themselves out? <laughs> so really pay attention to dosage because it's not something that you, uh, you should play around with. I remember back in the day, you know, we just throw a half ounce in a batch of brownies. We didn't even know what the word decarboxylation meant, um, but the, the weed would be ground up. So it would actually, the micro fragments of weed would decarb mostly decarb itself out and be so damn strong that people were just like, Oh my God, this batch of brownies is so wrecking me or, Oh, these brownies aren't so strong or so with, with the, with the scale now, and we're all scale nerds because we used to sling weed, you know, work your dosage out, especially if you are around tested weed. And I know that's another argument in itself, the labs and the testing and what's real and what's not. But if you get a general idea, oh, this weed is 25% or this Keith or this RSO is 82% and you're dividing it by 12 pieces or 12 cookies, you know, and it's, you know, 87%, so 870 milligrams per gram divided by the 12 cookies. It's really simple math. Dosage is hugely important because who wants to wreck Aunt Sally on fucking Christmas? Right, right. Exactly. And and people who have been greened out, they know that sometimes it can be kind of an uncomfortable experience. Yeah, and it'll turn it somebody that really should be looking into uh, the use of cannabinoids in cannabis. It might turn them away even further because they were like, oh, yeah, I tried to gummy. It was 100 milligrams and I don't remember shit or I was wrecked and throwing up and hallucinating, which all those things can happen. Yeah, we've uh, we've used uh, we've used uh, cannabis butter on the farm before, uh, just to help animals uh, who have been traumatized, or like we had a hog that had a screw in its jaw and its mouth. Oh, yeah. You can't yeah. stick your hand inside a four hundred pound hog's mouth, you know. So we yeah. took one of those mini crocks of butter and gave it to the hog, and I'd say within forty five minutes to an hour, it was laying on its side asleep. Yep, and uh, my nephew just backed it out with uh, a little uh, screw gun, brought it right back out. And so, yeah, the cannabis butter and those those things can be very powerful and um, used well. They can really work, I think, really well for like uh, pain medicine, pain management. Uh, it has a very heavy effect, a very more. Well, can you talk a little bit about the way your liver metabolizes cannabis? Mm -hmm. I guess it's in that double, that double pass. And, you know, that's why me as a diabetic, I really don't eat a lot of it because it intensifies it in that, in that pass so much more than smoking cannabis. Even if you're taking a huge dab, you know, you get all sweaty and your body gets rid of it quick. If you take a great half gram dab, but when it gets in that, 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 starts metabolizing in that liver <clears throat> that shit's in there 
That's why you reach actually can reach levels of like hallucinating from, you know, too much cannabis and you can't shake it off. I mean, it's in there and it amplifies it. It's almost like what we were, what we'll discuss later about the psilocin and psilocybin. Well, let's go ahead and start uh, shifting gears and kind of move in that direction. Um, how did you start your fungi journey and, uh, Tell us about kind of how it's led you up to this moment in time. So, you know, my family came here about 1947, 48 as immigrants from Northern Italy and mushrooms are a huge part of our culture, uh, <clears throat> you know, culinary. Um, and, you know, we have the, the, we have hallucinogenic mushrooms over there, whether it be Amanita or some of the other psilocybe species, but not very many of the psilocybe you know, Central European block is more on that um, drying and decarboxylating the Amanitas campfire style and eating them for the, uh, and you even wrote down on the notes, the name of the chemical that uh, when decarboxylated is the hallucinogenic properties in Amanita. But uh, so truffles and all the things that are thought of as rich cultural foods from Italy, they're not rich foods, they're all peasants. Uh, that are out gathering these ingredients. So being in a culinary world, of course, you're a chef over here whose family came from Italy. Um, the first thing I'm like, where are the truffles locally? Where are the mushrooms locally? Where do the, where do the wild things grow? Um, and <clears throat> as a 17-year-old who got caught with quite a bit of cannabis and had to go on that five-year vacation, I, um, when I got out, I was 17 when I went in. When I got out, you know, I was in my early twenties and the PTSD of going to prison, you know, from Walla Walla, McNeil Island, Fallen Bay, uh, really fucked my head up, you know, uh, made me really short, made me, uh, not tolerant of a lot of things. So knowing that I grew up here in the Pacific Northwest and we forged for everything from ovoids to Liberty caps, we were turning cow patties over when we first started looking for Liberty caps in fields and then you find out that there's azies or, you know, uh, as a on the, on the coast. Um, you really kind of go for those because those are way more potent than some of the other ones. We have five or six different uh, psilocybe or psilocybin based mushrooms here in the Pacific Northwest. So as soon as I got onto that part of the therapy for me, uh, the PTSD of going to prison therapy was actually foraging and eating wild freshies and as resins specifically. Um, that was part of the therapy or psilocybin therapy for me. And then being, you know, involved in the mushroom world gastronomically, I got invited to do quite a few very cool projects. Like uh, we just wrote the fantastic Fungi cook, community cookbook with Eugenia Bone uh, that's based after the movie that Paul Stamets and uh, Louis Schwartzberger did, Fantastic Fungi. Um, and mushrooms, like I said, I've always, I'm a, truffle broker during truffle season which is here in about a week i'll start moving truffles um like we all used to move bags of of, of weed I, I move bags of truffles coolers full of truffles in truffle season uh and i get more per pound for them than we do weed nowadays uh which is kind of crazy you know so that's kind of like kept me deep in the mushroom world and i don't say mycological world or my you know mycophagy the eating of mushrooms definitely one of my passions Definitely. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the difference between the experiences of uh, naturally sourced uh, mushrooms versus uh, farmed like uh, cubenses or whatever? So, you know, most of everything that we eat are on the cube side nowadays is what most of the growers are telling me. I mean, we have three or four growers that are really contracted closely to us for me to have fruit all the time. I usually have three or four different kinds of, uh, fruit available um by the ounce by the pound whatever and we make a line of six different micro doses that also include lion's mane chaga reishi and turkey tail which are those other you know adaptogenic and really uh powerful mushrooms on the side of health and uh neurological replacement and you know keeping your brain sharp so the the for me I really like the therapy of the wild mushrooms like Azzy's, but now with people doing exactly what they did with weed, you know, there's like, there was weed and then now there's like weed, 
Well, in the mushroom world, the mushroom world moved way faster than the weed world. Um, we have s s s types of mushrooms now like Enigma and things that are just so strong and will contain a ton of the psilocin and, and more doses and percentages than other mushrooms like the LBMs, like, you know, back in the day, everything was an LBM, a little brown mushroom, like the golden teacher or, you know, something like that. But now it's gone crazy. There's one ounce dried mushrooms pe from penis MVs and Melmac reverts. And there's, there's almost like too much too fast. And I think that's why a state like us, Oregon, you know, I live on the border. I live in Vancouver, Washington, um, but uh, helping with I-34 and I-109 and seeing where psilocybin therapy is going, I think it's kind of good that they put the law in place in Oregon that Cubenzi based is going to be what they're going to use, which is pretty wide. And it excludes some of the wild ones, like my favorites, the Azarezins, but we all know where to find them. So we don't have to worry about the therapy. We can do it. Right. Our <laughs> right. And so now with the, uh, um, with the therapies, are those going to be controlled through like the state licensing therapist and, and it, and what about the idea of decriminalization for Oregon? But yet, if I go pick one out of the field, I'm a felon. Um, so, yeah, I got like, so the, as a forager and as somebody that's uh, forged for wild psilocybin for well over 30 years, um, I, I, I know what you're feeling. Uh, with the I-34, I-109, I uh, I and the push for legal psilocybin therapy in the state of Oregon, um, we were all fooled. Um, basically, we were all fooled. And we didn't know that it was going to be like this. And we also, it's going to be hard for, Oregon is never going to have a place where you can go and buy mushrooms, grab an eighth and leave, except for the mushroom shop. And we all saw what happened with, with that on Burnside um, through the news and through everything else and through the federal lists and things like that. So <clears throat> my biggest argument is, is I have a lot of friends that are vets and they fought for my freedom to be able to do what I want to do, go to the grocery store. Uh, go camping, um, just live, you know, basically in the freedoms that I enjoy every day. And the therapy sessions for the state of Oregon are going to be set to where it's around $1,500 and that's to be worked out. And you go and you basically go into a room and you have a trip sitter, you take your 3.5 gram dose or whatever it's going to be scheduled for as a hero dose or a breakthrough dose is what they're going to consider. And you sit there with blinders on and somebody holding your hand and I have asked some of my friends that are vets that fought in uh, many of the wars that have happened in Afghanistan, and they're not ready to put a blindfold on and hold somebody's fucking hand they don't know and talk about their problems when they can't even really do it at home with their family. And that's the reason why they need to psilocybin in, thir in the first place, let alone yeah. will they be able to afford $1,500. Most of them right. are veterans. Yeah. You know, so I've got big problems with that. I don't agree with any of that. Um, I want it more readily available like cannabis. If they want to take a thing of microdoses home and the microdoses are only up to 200 milligrams, which is like 0.2 of a gram, and there's 30 of them in a container, well, they fucking give them Prozac and everything else. What's wrong with that going home? It's a microdose. You'd have to eat, you know, 40 of them. You'd be sick stomach-wise before you'd be fucking high. <laughs> you know? Uh, so my arguments are i think that well i can tell you right now as you as a grower saw the price and everybody else that's involved with cannabis saw cannabis go i can get pounds of cannabis that are semi quality for 200 bucks a pound you know 400 bucks a pound 600 bucks a pound um when i got caught for cannabis i was it was 5000 a pound it was worth it you know what i mean so the value has changed but i've seen in the past five months the price of black market psilocybin and i know a lot of people growing uh, mushrooms that are ready to break through people that own big cannabis companies that are doing research projects so on and so forth i've seen the price of mushrooms go between four to eight to even sixteen hundred dollars for designer fruit now you know and there's all levels so if that's happened in the past five months in our area of the country I can imagine what's going on elsewhere and you imagine what's going on with a state like Oklahoma and Kansas where it's like, it's the real wild, wild west. 
Yeah. Wait till the shit starts going crazy around here with the psilocybin, as we just saw with a store that tried to pop up, advertise, sell, and was shut down within what three weeks. Right. Well, I gotta say, when we were at Cowboy Cup last year, uh, people would walk up to the booth and hand us a bunch of cannabis. Uh, at the booth this year, people were handing us tons of mushrooms. We left at the end of the day with a pile of mushrooms, Man, chocolates, butter, every kind of consumable mushroom product you could think of. Yep. It's going to be crazy. really is. Interesting. Yeah, I can't... yeah, go ahead, Sam. I was going to, so, I mean, I was just thinking through the, um, the implications of this because with mushrooms, um, you can have several flushes of mushrooms or harvests of mushrooms within a few months time. Right. Well, cause like three months is, you know, a typical cycle for weed. Right. Um, I imagine you're getting, uh, multiple flushes in that time with your yeah. mushrooms. So way yeah, faster, it's, even if you're dealing with, uh, auto flower with cannabis, you're still going way faster with, uh, uh, tubs of Cubenzies really fast. Interesting. Yeah, you so, just, I um, haven't thought about that. Anyway, sorry, guys. That was a really fascinating segment. Um, th- funny, bro. Get yeah, there. yeah. And uh, shout out everyone who's watching on the live. We got Marshall and Gina and others on the live stream. Operation Annihilation. That's a cool name. Um, so shout out to you guys that are watching on the live stream. Thanks for watching. And if you're having a good time on the video, like and subscribe. It helps YouTube let us, you know, be discovered out there on the internet. Um, but JR, let's see, we had some more questions as we went into, I think it was, we were going to talk about mushroom hunting. Was that the next section? Yeah, we kind of went uh, into that a little bit. I wanted to kind of talk about uh, hunting as far as resources for identification, because like, like you and I probably had someone teach us in the field what to look for, and what not to look for. And not everybody has that luxury. What are some good resources that people can use? for identifications in their area? Um, You know, in the day of the keyboard warriors and all this, the internet and everything, um, it's really good. And and, and and I'm going to be honest here because it's a matter of life and death if you're out foraging. Like really, one mistake is not, it's it's your last mistake. Uh, So we can get all the books we want. We can get on the internet and get on the keyboard. But I would definitely recommend get sick, finding a, myco- a mycology society in your area, getting books, finding somebody that already goes out and forages and eats mushrooms, all of those things, that all of those things, not one of them, because it's not something you just play with and really getting out in the field with people that forage and are pointing out mushrooms and, you know, uh, going on a foray with the, uh, um, any up here in the Pacific Northwest, we have quite a we have a ton of uh, myco- mycological societies um, up and down the everywhere. Um, and going out on one of their forays and getting involved in one of their you know potlucks, because then you get around people that kind of do it all the time, and it's not just like a, a a weekend warrior type of thing. It's like me trying to grow weed. I can't grow weed. I leave it to you guys. You guys are the professionals. Um, so when you guys want to come out and forage mushrooms, I want you guys to ask me. Uh, hey, I need you to come and, you know, I need to come forage or I want to come forage or I want one specific mushroom or, hey, are you hunting truffles this year? Um, so that then you do it and then your job is to actually take your kids to do it so that they know and they do it comfortably in a stage where then they're showing their kids and it's something that we don't forget, kind of like my family did. Yeah, that's how it was for us. So, um with that, um, what are some of the uh, culinary varieties that that are really awesome to find around here in the Northwest? So you you asked a totally biased question because as a chef and somebody that has to cook for people, the chanterelle is my favorite mushroom in the world. Um, and I forage usually white chanterelles, rainbow chanterelles, golden chanterelles, and cascade chanterelles in one spot where we live. And that is one of my all time favorites. You know, we talked about me writing uh, recipes in weed world magazine on a monthly basis and maximum yield on a monthly basis. And 
uh, even a magazine, a cannabis magazine out of Greece called the Green Greeks. You know, one of my favorite recipes and it's gotten the most attention is a sriracha pickled wild chanterelle recipe. And mm. it's always re it's always requested. But uh, those chanterelles to me are great. Um, we have porcinis. We have truffles. Um, we have cauliflower mushrooms up here. We have oyster mushrooms up here. We have another one of my favorites, which is a lobster mushroom um, and truffles, the black organ, black truffles, not the white ones. The Oregon black truffles, unbelievable. Um, other mushrooms, morels, of course. Uh, morels was something that I got into in the early days of foraging, so I'm not so, I'm not so hip to chase the elusive morel. Uh, the chanterelles, I know where they're at, so I'm always out there. And we, uh, it, it's really important, like I said, to take your friends to show them. None of these spots. I'm not a gatekeeper. I don't have my spots. I don't have any land that belongs to me that's got mushrooms on it. The idea is to pass the knowledge on and not to be greedy, you know, because there's everybody should have access to a mushroom. Yeah, totally. Especially from a, a culinary perspective, they're very delicious. Absolutely. And very versatile, good. if you're looking at, you know, if you're looking at creating a good diet for yourself, that's a good way to eat a little bit of less meat and throw a mushroom in there. And we really got to get something straight with everybody is mushrooms aren't plants and they're not part of a plant-based diet. Mushrooms are mushrooms. Yeah. And um, speaking of that, can you talk about maybe some of the mushroom fermentations that people can do uh, maybe with psilocybin and non-psilocybin fermentation? Uh, we oh I want to grab something uh, real quick too. Uh, fermentations <laughs> are really important, but uh, I should have grabbed this a while ago. Sorry, I sorry I disappeared real quick, but we just actually made a little bit of blue water. I don't know if you guys are familiar with blue oh, water. Oh, cool! This is uh, a nice way if you have freshies around, um, and uh, you really are into uh, consuming psilocybin in different ways. Um, you can actually make blue water and let your blue water form a SCOBY. And from that SCOBY, you can start your kombucha with blue water, have micro, you know, have micro amounts of psil psilocybin in it. But if you let this ferment into kombucha, I mean, you can see the blue in this. Uh, that's that all that blue is psilocybin. So you basically have psilocybin kombucha ready to roll. I'd be careful on the, on the dosage, but <laughs> You know what I mean? That's exciting. I imagine you could go through gallons of that at a dead show. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I actually have gallons available for anybody. It's w <laughs> That's great. That is great. Yeah, that's some trippy, some trippy water that you're handing out to everyone. <laughs> yeah, we call it blue water. Definitely. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually really nice. I love that. I'm glad you that's guys cool. see that blue water. And those are freshies floating around in there. And basically, it's really simple for anybody that would want to make blue water at home. You take the weight of mushrooms that are fresh. If you grow a bag or have a little tub or get some freshies from a grower friend to a weight of ice and to the weight of water. And I usually put it in the blender and fucking pulverize it and then strain it and then put it right into the fridge. But you can get it almost triple dark as that. And then we just put a couple of freshies in there to you know, add a little bit to it because you can pop those things like maraschino cherries and holidays. Nice. Wow. That's and are awesome. you straining it through like a cheesecloth or something like that or like a strainer or something? Um, so in the kitchen, we have this thing called the chinois, which is a French, it's like a, it's like the most fine particle cone kitchen strainer, jelly strainer thing that you can get. But I don't even mind if there's some particles in there. But, you know, people like to see that blue without a bunch of little tiny shit yeah. floating. Um, but yes. Yeah. Whatever you feel like. Interesting. That's cool. And, you know, we ferment the culinary and gastronomic mushrooms as well, just like you would do, um, you know, like a two and a half to five percent salt solution in water. I love to ferment chanterelles. Little buttons. Oh, my goodness. I imagine it's really nutrient dense too. I can imagine, right? Yeah, and the chanterelle uh, holds up, whereas a lot of the other mushrooms don't really hold up to do that. 
you would have to get an agaricus, which is basically the white button mushroom or cremini mushroom at the grocery store. Yeah. To hold up like that. Are people ever like pickling psilocybin mushrooms? And does that work? I've, bro, I've done everything you can fucking imagine, everything yeah. you can think of. And some things work, and 80% of them are novelty, just like the cannabis world, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of the cannabis world, I was, uh, I seen a thing where a gentleman had juice cannabis, but he had mixed it with citrus uh, juice, like lime and that. And it de- and they decarbed and got him high as uh, high as fuck. Is that something you can kind of attest to? So I can't attest to that, but it's called lemon tech. Is actually what that's called, and the possibilities of that as acidulation in the water of the lemon juice is possible, from what I've heard, to actually be warm enough to decarboxylate THCA. And yeah, I mean, so we can't say it can't work, you know? Yeah, because the gentleman who did it, uh, did he didn't want to get high from cannabis, but he wanted to have some uh, health benefits from juicing the leaves. And he yeah. had juiced the leaves with l- a lime and grapefruit. And he said he was high for almost two days from a class of juice. Wow. Yeah, And grapefruit, people really got to be careful of that because, you know, you... Uh, every now and then when you're watching TV, you see these commercials and it's like, uh, take the medication, but make sure you don't use it with grapefruit juice or those interactions. We're talking chemicals. And I mean, cannabis has more chemicals. Psilocybin has more chemicals. There's all these chemicals working with our chemical. We've got to be careful how we alter it and add and, you know, take things. It was just like them trying to give me my diabetes medicine with held together in a pill with sucrose i was like wait a fucking minute i'm a diabetic what are you doing <laughs> you know? yeah counterintuitive mm-hmm. so now can you talk a little bit about like uh foraging beyond like mushrooms what are some of the things like if you're out at the out at the seashore or in the mountains what are some different foraging opportunities there yeah, are just kind of across the different um environments that we have i guess here So I would say the first thing that people should learn how to do is is that, unfortunately, some people, I would say 50% of our users are, 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 people are probably have a yard. If you don't spray your yard with any chemicals, learn what a dandelion is. After the dandelion, I would, I would find out what wild nettles are, urtica, dioica. It's uh, in Italy, we use it for everything, especially where I'm from in in Italy. Um, Wild nettles, they don't sting because they're trying to hurt you they sting because they're so good they're trying to keep you away is the like italian way to think about it you know um other than that i would on the coast here we have an unbelievable resource of uh plants that grow in a combination of salt water and fresh water brackish um we have actually five of plants that can live in that condition i think there's like eight or eleven in the planet we have five of them here in our bays in, in, in the Pacific Northwest. So salcornia or glasswort or uh, sea beans, they're called. Yeah, um, sea beans. Good. Yeah. And another thing is if you ever get a chance to go up to Alaska, that's either called clinket or Indian salt because they dry it, grind it, and they use it for salt on dishes. Um, another thing is is like um, uh, chickweed. Um it's so wild fennel, which grows along the Columbia all the way to the mouth of the, the Columbia River out at the coast. And if you're at the coast, I mean, you might as well forage for some psilocybin as a residence because, well, you're out at the coast and who doesn't want to eat freshies? Like our season for wild psilocybin here, especially the Azis, um, uh, in our sector is probably from November 5th to sometimes January, believe it or not. And you can usually find ovoids and cyans. You can find five different psilocybin mushrooms right there on the the coast. Some, the psilocybin is very low, so you'd have to make a big batch of tea. But then there are some like azies, which are strong as hell. Um, And ovoids usually come plentiful. Azies, you got to pick a long time to pick a lot of them. but I mean, you can drive along people's yards on Long Beach and spot blue ringers, stunsies. You can all the all the ones that we were talking about, Liberty Caps, 
azurescence ovoids. So now with azurescence, they're on the beach grass. How is there like a mycelial network within sand and beach grass? Well, that deep, deep that seagrass has to decompose when it goes dead, right? Just like yeah. a dead tree. So it creates the mycelium between the layer of the sand and the decomposing. So you got a bunch of that shit decomposing all the time underneath that sand. And it's just, I mean, it's strong because look at the sand. It, it gets wet frequently. And then look at the, the that little strip of like coastal area. It gets like good rain. Think about that. Man, the porcinis, the king bolites, and the deliciosas, the other mushrooms other than the psilocybin mushrooms. That. That little 27 mile stretch of beach is actually one of the mushroom capitals of the world that people just don't realize. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, I, I'm sure at some point it'll be mushroom tourism before it too is. long. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and we were talking about what, what we do. We actually, you I lived on the peninsula for eight years. I, um, I built a few hotels there. I, worked in some very iconic restaurants. I worked in a restaurant that James Beard himself used to go to. And for chefs, James Beard is, you know, the shit. Uh, but I created a network of mushroom people there. And we actually own a company called Camp Ruderalis. That's a self, like selfless plug right there. Uh, oh, good. And, and we take people out foraging for wild psilocybin during the season for Azzy's. We did this past year. And actually you guys, uh, uh, here on this show, help facilitate, you know, somebody that runs another big show all the way from Canada coming down and coming to our event and foraging psilocybin mushrooms and hanging out for the weekend and, you know, look, listening to the authors of the mycologists. And we were actually working on another book, uh, the same author that we did Fantastic Food Guy Community Cookbook with on psilocybin mushrooms, uh, there at the event. So to have Brett come and, uh, it, it, I, I have to say thank you to you guys because you guys really helped facilitate that. Especially you, Jr. You pulled the strings, bro. Yeah, I wanted him to get down and kind of experience what the Northwest has to offer. I mean, uh, it's very unique. This area, I would say, between BC, Canada, and like Tillamook. You know, hell yeah, it's very unique. It's very unique, and I never realized, you know, what a what a like uh, mycology center of the universe I was at as a child. You know, I started picking at a very, very young age and it changed me, obviously. Uh, a lot of people say I'm crazy, but that's cool. <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk about more uh, events and uh, some stuff that you're excited about coming up here in the future. Yes. So um, as I said, Camp Ruderalis. Uh, named after the wild cannabis, you know, Ruderalis, is uh, we've got probably three or four events coming up this year. We always will do, they're called Papawis, and uh, we do the Papawi Long Beach is always in November. And that one is always based around psilocybin azurescence or the Azis and Azzy season. Um, and we also do other forays uh, for just culinary and gastronomic mushrooms. Um, like at Silver Creek Falls, we'll have a foray this year that'll be based around chanterelles, lobster mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, and some of the other uh, mushrooms there. And then we also have events like that are cannabis and wild oyster harvesting on the coast or up in the Hood Canal. Um, and just to try to get people, you know, connected with everything. Cannabis is, and, you know, they looked at us all like we were hippies back in the day because we wore patchouli and smoked weed and wanted to hang out with other people that did the same thing. And it's like, I still want to do those things, but we all have levels of things that we like. Uh, like I can learn about growing from you guys and, and then I can take you guys out and we can pick mussels and wild oysters off the beach, you know? Right. Um, that's really important. So our events are kind of immersion events into those things. Uh, the weekend of psilocybin picking it's great because people not only pick psilocybin, they pick king boletes, you know, porcinis and chanterelles and mushrooms that bioilluminesce under black lights. You know, I think our mushroom table had maybe 60 or 70 species, uh, different things on it this, this year, including five different kinds of psilocybin. And most people are like, wow, you can still pick psilocybin out in the wild. And uh, yeah, it's out there. 
Yeah, it's really important resource, I think, to people. And I think it's something that we need to protect and keep for the people. And kind of speaking on that, as you've seen things kind of unfold with cannabis legalization, and now you're seeing things kind of unfold in the psilocybin community, what are some of the things you think people can do to kind of bring uh, the fungi back to the people? It's going to be hard because this all is based on a fucking dollar and a dollar sign. And there are some greedy ass people that'll hide behind some weird shit you know, uh, they'll, they'll throw money into a psilocybin business and some of them haven't even eaten mushrooms before or know the therapeutic value. They just see a trend like they did with cannabis. Right. And then you see the shit that's going to happen like that's happening in Oklahoma where it's not about, it's not about medicine. And then the true people are going to get left behind. Like we always talk now about legacy and legacy farmers and you know, where did all these genetics come from before there was gelato number 43, you know? Right. Well, you, you know, so the commercialization, it's going to happen. And we're already seeing it in Oregon because the facilitator licenses are expensive. The facility is expensive. You know, the, you basically have to build a small hospital is what you're going to have to do and have people on hand, a trip sitter, a hand holder, you know, all this shit, somebody to control the 3.5 gram dose and i just don't see how i'm gonna fit into that so it boils me down to i hope all the home growers cannabis psilocybin aren't forgotten and left behind like what happened in the early days of all legalization in every different state with cannabis um their geneticists get left behind who created what what legacy was, who broke, whose back got broken when, when they went to prison for five years. Um, I wasn't addicted to weed when I went to prison. I was addicted to money, but I was too stupid to know. Now you go to weed, you go to prison for weed and it's like you, you're, you're an activist. And I understand all that, but it sure seems like corporations, people can't even say, well, here, here it is, for instance, right here. I'm going to stop this right now and I'm going to say, hey, JR, that shirt you got on right there, is probably one of the badasses t-shirts I've seen in the past three, four fucking years. I was at Seattle Hemp Fest 17 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the, the going back to activism when we always used like I when I was when I got out of prison, when before I went into prison, Seattle Hemp Fest was the first place I ever smoked out in public. When I got out of prison, it was the only place I smoked out in public. Uh so we just can't let those things get forgotten because of the commercialization, you know, of, of cannabis and what's going to truly happen with psilocybin and psilocybin is going to happen way faster because the therapeutic benefits are, well, you can't really drive a car from the therapeutic benefits you'll get from a hero dose. So they know they're going to have to control it because they can't give you some substance where 20 minutes later you get into a fucking car and you're tripping balls so fucking hard you can't drive. It doesn't make sense. So we got to make sense of what legalities are going to be. We got to abide by them so that we can get them. But $1,500 for a 3.5 gram session and a fucking hand holder. No, thank you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I heard uh, uh, Sanjay Gupta on CNN talking about how it, it's important that we have pharmaceutical psilocybin so that we can monitor dosing and handle safe therapeutic value to our to our patients they're just trying to get more aspects of it in their fucking hands for money grubby bastards <laughs> it's so true my friend and you can see the narrative happening with psilocybin very fast like you said it's happening very fast yeah you know um we, here here's another way to gauge it i lived along the colorado river in arizona for a better part of my youth and it was not a joke that you would lick the toads, but their 5-MeO-DMT was pretty much readily available uh, from the Sonoran Desert Toad, the Colorado River Toad. But it was a spiritual thing with the Hopi Indians, the Navajos, and all the Indians and the Latinos that were down there. It wasn't like a white, a white boy thing, you know what I mean? But it was, I knew about it. But did you see this year, they actually, the National Park Service had yeah. to put a fucking warning out? Yeah. That, that's how much we're going... People are trying to seek 
things. And then now we have this huge DMT market that's like synthetic DMT that who knows what the fuck it is. I'd rather lick a toad. Uh, but right. you know what I mean? So we're seeing how fast things are moving away from the days of uh, being at Seattle Hempfest, smoking in public and going, yeah, you know, and listening to the Cottonmouth Kings or Cypress Hill or, you know, Bob Marley or Ziggy Marley or whoever we were listening to. Right. I would say that I, uh, when we visited Emerald Cup, it was, I felt the vibe was a little more kind of take it back. You know what I mean? I think they were trying to bring value to the legacy right. farmer and they showed a lot of love for the legacy farmer. And it was really a strong event for them. And I really thought the vibe of Emerald Cup this year was, was a lot better than the past couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, and the, at Santa Rosa, at the end of last year, not this year, uh, or the middle of this year, the early event that they had, um, because, you know, it's like a two-part series, however they yeah. put the end of the cup up. Uh, my, a friend of mine who did 21 years in the uh, federal system uh, got out and is doing movies now and documentaries, docu-series. He's actually the one that wrote the script for and did White Boy Rick about Rick Wershey. Uh, who owns the cannabis company called The Eighth, who did, you know, 21, 28 years in the penitentiary as well uh, behind the feds. But you can look him up. But Seth Ferranti, close, close, close friend of mine, uh, just produced a three-part docuseries about legacy farmers up in the Triangle, and it's called Tangled Roots. And I'm not trying to give him a plug. I'm just trying to get everybody to understand that those people don't have enough water to to water their crops, and they're fighting big companies like, you know, companies that, have now billions of dollars to to coca-cola what did to rc type of shit you know yeah uh you know we don't have artisan sodas anymore we don't even have artisan beers like rainier and Oli because of the big companies that come in but i like all of them to exist if they're going to exist but the support has to come from everybody you just can't support the person that has the cool baby blue t-shirt because it's baby blue you know yeah no totally yeah that's what jr and i you know when we're at emerald cup um i go specifically to support those small farms you know we go and spend time specifically at those booths and talk to those um folks uh because we want to know that that you know we support them um and definitely encourage everyone out there um in the chat uh martial artist 2012 was talking about um the buy local mentality um you know ap applies here as well jr often says support your local grower in this case it means local grower of cannabis or of mushrooms or fungi as well um support Let that local small familiar. business yeah, lettuce and tomatoes too. All of it. Yeah. Keep it local. For sure. Well, um, JR, I think we rounded up um, at the end of our interview pretty much, right? Yeah, we did a great job. I thought we got through stuff really well. Thank you. I appreciate it a lot, Chef. Anytime. You know that. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate the friendship. And I love that shirt. I'm going to say it once again. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting the other half. Yeah. Uh, and, um, so I will see you probably in two or three months, maybe for some morels or maybe yes. April for some chanterelles. But I'll see you before then. We live close. <laughs> yes, we will. You will see me soon, brother. And, so uh, you know, anybody out there, I'm not promoting the use of psilocybin or the sales of psilocybin. But if anybody out there is uh, going through something that needs uh, like some psilocybin therapy, I'd be more than happy to give somebody some help uh, if they were to reach out. So don't be afraid. This is still a small community amongst a lot of people, just like all the growers were giving people weed back in the day when somebody else didn't have it. Say something. Speak up. That's how we'll get it back. That's how we'll get it back. Well, um, Sebastian, um, you've been, um, we are totally down with you plugging and shouting out all the things. So you've already plugged a couple. You mentioned Camp Ruderalis. Please plug it again and let people know where they can check out your stuff and follow you and learn more about what you're up to. I'm pretty much on Instagram. Um, unless, of course, you need that bag of mushrooms, then you got to get my number. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm pretty much on Instagram. Camp Ruderalis is on Instagram. You can go to camprudoralis.com for our events. Sign up as a member. 
Um, uh, some of them are psilocybin based and we try not to advertise that too loudly, but uh, you heard it here on, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. And um, I'm sure you guys will be out to an event uh, and we like to make them to where everybody gets to enjoy them. And um, that's what I'm saying. I really appreciate you guys having me on, uh, especially this time of year. Uh, I believe today is winter solstice. So happy yeah. solstice. Yeah. Yeah. Too. Happy solstice. It's the darkest time of the year, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. It was a really interesting conversation. We got to touch on some interesting stuff that we haven't gotten before. We'd love to have you back again sometime yes. and talk about more about this stuff. Um, so we'll have to touch base uh, later in 2023. It's wild to believe that we are just couple weeks away from 2023 uh, <laughs> we made it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so um on that note uh well, we've got one more show left in the uh next week which will be our last show of the year i believe last show of 2022 uh, so uh keep locked here on youtube.com slash cannabis we appreciate everyone who sub uh subscribes and supports us there we really appreciate it again uh, make sure to check out our discord server it's a great way to stay connected with us and uh, shout out to our sponsor, Tiki Madman. Without him, we would not have been able to have a great time at Emerald Cup. And without him, we wouldn't have been able to do a lot of things. So make sure to support uh, TikiMadman.com if you need some great genetics. Well, Sebastian, um, we've have been having a great night. Shout out to everyone in the chat. They've all been having a great time. They said great stuff. Um, had a li have a lifted evening, Gina said. Um, so we're all having a good one. So peace all. Have a great one and a great uh, Christmas coming up. Great holiday. Yours love. Much love.